Can people post Mastodon now? Yeah, fucking post cool. Mastodon all goddamn day long. I don't care. Yeah, because we're going to build something <laughs> way better than Mastodon, right? Like, come on, how hard could it be to beat these guys? Uh, you know, for ev- from an evolutionary standpoint, how'd that work out for the Mastodons? I don't know what a Mastodon was. <laughs> <laughs> so Elon Musk recently had a discussion on his Twitter Spaces feature, which was both enlightening and uh, quite amusing, I would say. So this video is just me, Saeed, the Coder Grammar, rambling about that that Twitter Spaces thing. Um, so if you're used to the usual kind of tech videos and tutorials, this this might not be the video for you. But if you're interested in tech in general and the wider kind of tech landscape, then uh, hopefully this will be um, still interesting to you. So Twitter Spaces is this kind of uh, feature that's very similar to what Clubhouse was, where basically people can talk live. So it's not like YouTube where you, well, you can go live on YouTube, but it's generally not like YouTube. It's all about live interactions and people can ask questions and join in the conversation. And it's uh, it's somewhat moderated. So this discussion was was hosted by George Hotz. I think that's how you pronounce his name. And if you don't know him, he's uh, on Twitter. You can see there. And there's a, a Wikipedia entry for him as well, which is kind of interesting. He's a he's a kind of a, a hacker slash developer. And I think he was on some kind of internship. At, in fact, it probably says it here, but he was on... Uh, yeah, it mentions here that he was on a 12-week internship, which sounds a bit strange. But yeah, he was on an internship and he's hosting this, um, this Twitter Spaces discussion. Speed with the engines on fire and the controls don't work. Yeah. I use the same analogy at comma. Can we afford good food? Yeah. Well, <laughs> it, it, um, it's, it's really important to me. No, I think we, we can afford good food. Um, the, 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 like the, the, the madness of the, for example, the uh, headquarters food budget was that it was $13 million a year of fixed rate, no matter how many people showed up. So if the normal meal price would have been if the building was fully occupied, twenty dollars for actually a quite a good lunch. The 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 food was good. Then, but if you if you are, if you drop to five percent occupancy, you've now multiplied the effective meal cost by twenty, and that's where you get a four hundred dollar lunch, literally. Uh, yeah, absolutely. The, the the food was great. I loved the cheese seed pudding and the smoothies in the morning. But yeah, you got to tell everyone to come into the office. It's crazy to me that people think they can have a job where they don't show up to an office. And there's already some very entertaining commentary about this discussion because it's like quite long, as you can see, and other people have talked about it and uh, it's been published on multiple YouTube channels, I believe. Um, I'll include a link to that in, in the description below anyway. So as I said, there's already some entertaining commentary from the likes of Tech Lead. Um, there's other people that have commented on this as well. Uh, there's a particularly amusing part where he kicks off at one of the contributors. But listen, sometimes I, these actually, advertisers will serve entirely different versions of I, the same ad listen, to different can you turn this guy off, please? He's just talking nonsense. Thanks. Um, now you can decide whether you think that's justified or not. The the guy that he took aim at is actually on Twitter. Um, is this guy here? And there is a whole discussion about it. You can see there's a link to it here. In fact, let me just pause that because it's auto playing. Um, and uh, yeah, so the people are talking about it. So you can you can click onto that and have a look if you're interested uh, and decide whether that's justified or not. But I think for me, the reason why this video was really interesting is because it, based on my experience of over 20 years of working with, with software, is that it's a really good insight into what the reality of working in a software environment is, especially for a larger organization. And I think that's particularly relevant and interesting now because everybody's panicking or talking at least about ChatGPT, GitHub Copilot, Amazon Code Whisperer, and the, the plethora of other uh, AI tools that are out there to help you uh, help you and take your job at the same time. And while I do think that given enough time, these tools <laughs> will have a major, major impact on our jobs, if not all jobs. But I think what this video highlights really well is something that I tell other developers, which is that in actual fact, you spend a lot of time doing other things, non-coding activities. Okay. So uh, you might be evaluating COTS products, which are custom off the shelf products, whether they're going to do what you need them to do, whether they're worthwhile investment or whether you should just uh, build what you need. Uh, you're looking at design, you're looking at various open source tools, evaluating them, prototyping them. Um, you're looking at how these things integrate with the wider business. You're having discussions with the business when they're asking for something you think 
maybe it should be implemented in a slightly different way. You're going backwards and forwards. Um, you know, you're just kind of communicating what you're doing to the wider business. You might be demoing. If you're not demoing, there's a whole bunch of meetings that take place within most kind of most of agile um, environments, which most software development projects are these days, at least the ones I've worked in. And the point of this is to highlight that whilst whilst Copilot or Chat GPT can make coding a lot faster, um, they're not at present able to, in my opinion, replace any developers at all. And that's at least not on the projects I've worked on. And that's because there's so much more to delivering a piece of functionality than to just generate some functions. Okay, there's a lot more, there's a lot more nuance, there's a lot more to it, and there's a lot more proprietary information as well. So whilst uh, chat GPT is able to understand all kinds of stuff off the internet, all kinds of stuff from the wider business landscape. It might not know the specifics of your organization. Um, it probably will eventually. I'm sure there'll be ways of training it on your internal proprietary stuff in a way that maybe it's not published to the wider world, but so that it has some context. But but regardless of that, at the moment, it's not capable of doing that. So back to this discussion, they do talk about issues like onboarding time, complexity. There's a part of the discussion where they talk about developer experience. They talk about whether they should be able to run the app locally. <laughs> ah, hilarious. Um, so, uh, George, you mentioned that at Facebook, everything could run locally. Um, I've worked at companies where we had a dedicated team just for developer experience. Uh, and their job was like literally to dockerize and containerize everything and just make the app run. Uh, so people that can code can code. Um, and it just sounds like Twitter's lacking that. Yeah, you want to hire those people for Twitter? I think Twitter's definitely lacking that. So, yeah. I mean, <laughs> Elon, how far, how far are you guys away from having a, an engineer, like a new engineer on day one, just, you know, walk in, go through quick orientation and then get a de like a single dev instance running and just being able to submit a PR on, on the same day or maybe the same. A week. dev instance? No, Twitter doesn't believe in that. We have prod and sometimes. <laughs> um, or a local, any kind of local. It, it is local. <laughs> No, there's it, it's 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 I I think to your point it 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 it, it takes a while. Um, there's so much custom stuff that just understanding where everything is and how it all connects, uh, I think is a matter it, it, it takes at least a few weeks. Um, so I th I think it is would be difficult to be productive, you know, without at least a month of intense effort. I mean that yeah. And and that would be like you're really good at software if you, I'd say if if you can do something useful in a month. I mean, these are conversations that I've probably had on every single project I've been on for any length of time, um, and it's just a really good insight for someone who's new to software development to understand what the world of tech really looks like. And also, somebody who even works in tech might look at someone like Elon Musk who's working on SpaceX and Tesla and think actually software development is completely different at these organizations. But what they're talking about is the same kind of problems you face in pretty much every other organization. And a lot of that discussion isn't just low level code. For me, there's a particularly interesting uh, part of the discussion where they talk about how the software or Elon Musk talks about how the software is so meshed in with every other part of the software ecosystem that it's very hard for them to make changes because one part impacts everything else. Now, to me, that's a, quite a considerable design consideration when you're building something, how it impacts. Can other systems kind of bounce off it in a way that they don't become constrained by it? Do you have like a light API where you can still internally make improvements, publish new API changes, or does everything just fall apart if you make uh, the slightest change? So these are kind of very common things that you have to deal with in, in um, large software projects. Complexity. I mean, the, the the Twitter stack right now is, is is like basically combining the difficulties of three different worlds, which is running um, a a complex real time on prem database that's in three data centers in Atlanta, uh, uh, one near uh, in, in Oregon, and one in Sacramento. And Sacramento is like possibly the worst place to have a data center because it's hot. And then like the summer, the, it, it got so hot that the data center failed because the HVAC didn't work. But then in addition to that, you've got also using AWS, so using Amazon, and using Google Cloud. So all three um, are required to operate uh, Twitter. And I think some of the problems that they describe are problems that I've seen in other places and actually seem very kind of solvable. I think the reason why they're having these conversations and why from the outside it looks very difficult is because they really 
talk about it as if it's super urgent. And there's a lot of uh, strain and pressure on them to deliver these things quickly because of the uh, financial situation of Twitter. So, the, you know, they talk about the runway and how much time do they have left and all that kind of stuff. And that's why you see more and more things being launched. In fact, I've already had notifications about, uh, I think it's premium blue or the blue tick or whatever, where you can pay, uh, you can pay some amount every month to get the blue tick. And that comes with certain benefits. Um, so I think the technical challenges they have are not technical challenges that I haven't really seen anywhere else at any other organization. The technical challenges here are to do all of those things and to fix all of those problems, but very, very quickly. Another interesting thing is that George Hotz um, and Tech Lead talks about this in his video as well, that George Hotz keeps mentioning refactoring. Because my kids are going to buy Robux or app, you know, they're going to be buying stuff no matter what. And I'd, I'd like to choose what they're exposed to. Refactors so first. Now, obviously, he's a he's a bright person. I assume I don't know him. I'm sure all the people in this conversation were were very brilliant, um, but it didn't seem to me like. I mean, if I was in that in this organization, I probably wouldn't be looking to generally just refactor everything because you could you could refactor everything to the nth degree and get it really nice and neat and tidy, and that might take you a year and a half or whatever whatever amount of time, depending on how much code they've got. And at the end of that, you haven't delivered any immediate business value. And it seems given their runway and given their timelines and how aggressively they want to turn this thing around, uh, it seems like to me anyway, refactoring isn't the issue. I'd probably be looking at where are the worst offenders, where are the bits or services that we're just spending a fortune, maybe some particular cloud product that we're using that's just costing a fortune and we could consolidate some of those things, just get those big wins. Obviously getting these paid products out there that, that Elon Musk is trying to get out, which you know may or may not be a good idea. It depends if, if the market sort of takes to them and obviously making it as advertiser friendly as possible. And they talk about all these things and um, yeah, there's lots of kind of ideas discussed. But I think the really important lesson for junior developers is that you really have to remember that when you're developing software, you'll more than likely be doing that in a business. That business is looking to get a return on its investment. So often when you see somebody say, no, we're not actually going to build that. And it's disappointing because you were excited about building some new feature. Um, that's not how the business of software development works. It, you're providing a service to build out a feature and that feature is going to cost X amount of money and the business wants to get a return on that. If they could take that 100K or whatever it is that it's going to cost to build a particular feature and deploy that 100K on a different feature or on a completely separate thing that would get them a better return, then why wouldn't they do that? These businesses just don't have an infinite um, pool of money. So I would um, encourage you to, to listen to this if you're interested in software. It's just a generally interesting discussion. Uh, maybe have a look at uh, the video by Tech Lead on this. And as always, I'm very interested to hear your thoughts. And uh, yeah, don't forget to subscribe. And if this format is something that you find useful or not useful, let me know in the comments below. Thank you for watching.